Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time to talk a little bit more about Star Wars. The Rise of Skywalker by the numbers. This is going to be my full analysis where I go through all of the different categories of what the movie's doing and come up with a score for those that will hopefully be justified by what I'm going to say and average all of that down to find a final score, my final judgment as to the, the quality of this final entry into the uh, Skywalker saga, if you will. Before I get into the review, let me say that this review will contain spoilers. So if you don't want to know key plot details, this will not be the video for you. I did do another video without spoilers, so you can check that one out. Also, I will say that I'm probably not going to be doing a ton of nitpicking, like talking about this force power or that force power. I'm not going to be nitpicking the stuff that has to do with the larger Star Wars universe. There's a couple reasons for that. First of all, I don't really care that much at this point. This entire trilogy hasn't really referenced the previously established rule sets very much at all, so there's no real reason to expect it to do that now. There's also uh, other channels that are going to do that to a great extent and really be able to do that well, so you can, I assume, watch those videos. It might be a little bit of a distraction from what I talk about in this video. And also, if I was going to nitpick stuff, I think there's probably a lot of a lot of things that I missed simply because of the way this movie is constructed. It's very, very fast paced. So there's probably things that I would nitpick that I just didn't even really fully comprehend because of um, how the movie actually was. Now, before I get into all of the little categories, I do want to say that there's one overarching flaw and problem with The Rise of Skywalker, and that is the pacing. This is one of the fastest paced movies ever. It really does feel like two movies worth of material crammed into one, maybe like an entire TV series crammed into one movie, or maybe like you're watching all of the cutscenes from like a 40 hour game, just kind of edited into one movie. That's a lot about how it feels. It feels really too fast, so fast that um, it affects everything across the board. So one of the things I would expect is if they were to somehow release like an extended edition that had an extra 30 minutes to an hour to an hour and a half of material, this movie would actually be substantially better and all of the scores would be improved because this bad pacing actually affects your perception of everything in the movie. So the big problem is pacing. I mentioned that in the other movie. And if you watch this, I think you'll probably agree with me that that frantic pace is what really holds the movie back. But at the same time, I know JJ really probably didn't have a choice. He probably couldn't make a three and a half hour movie to do everything that he had to do in this movie. And so right from the get go, you're looking at a product that is severely bounded by limitations. So let's jump into production. Let's talk about the aspects of the visual nature of the movie, um, the sound, the music, uh, cinematography, all of that's going to be in production. So first category I talk about is aesthetics, which primarily deals with visual design. I give the aesthetics in this movie a 9 out of 10. I actually think the visual design is very, very well done throughout. There's a huge amount of variety and a huge amount of detail as well. So there's all these different planets you see. You see um, clips of like Kylo Ren fighting on strange planets. They visit, I think, five or six plus different worlds and different areas. All of them look different. All of them look unique. Some of them have really unique aliens in them, including some Cthulhu aliens, which I, I rather liked because I'm a fan of, of HP Lovecraft. But in general, the visual design is top notch. And I will say that it is far more original than the visual design I've seen in the previous two movies. So my hat's off to that. It actually felt like a development in the Star Wars universe rather than just completely rehashing uh, original trilogy aesthetics. The original trilogy aesthetics are still there, but we see lots of other things as well. So it was a real breath of fresh air to see new stuff finally in the Star Wars universe. And uh, the detail for all of them didn't lack for the fact that it was too fast paced. You weren't seeing a lot of seconds of a new ship on screen, but there were new ships. Um, so there's a good mixture of the old call, the callbacks to the older aesthetics, as well as new set pieces and new ships and things like that. Um, I would say I was pleasantly surprised with the visual, the visual detail in it. There is some evolution in the Sith ships when you get to the final act, which I appreciated rather than just rehashing X-wings and things like that. 
There's some legitimately effective use of darkness and contrast and desaturation of color, particularly when you get to the Sith auditorium scenes where um, you have Emperor Palpatine kind of cyber, kind of cyborgized on this on this giant thing that's hanging his decrepit body and this auditorium full of blue tinted shadowy figures um so there's actually some legitimate good use of darkness and contrast um there's a blue washing with most things that are evil that's a little bit subtle whenever you get on a say a first order ship you'll figure out that all the lights are actually blue whenever you go to the sith area everything's blue so um rather than using an emotion color like red like what ryan johnson did basically ripping off empire strikes back jj went with a blue color for um for like darkness and evil and i think it's actually pretty effective i didn't expect that amount of artistic you know overarching artistic detail or art, artistic drive or an intent that's what i'm looking for but there it is and it was actually very good um i will say that there's a lack of establishing shots and this is due to pacing so we don't get to see a lot of this beautiful world we want to see more of it but because things are going by so quickly it's almost like um like you're on a star tours ride if you ever been on Star Tours, especially the newer one where you're like flashing hyperspace between these different worlds, you're in a pod race. That's kind of what it feels like. At the beginning of the movie, in fact, there's, he's like hyperspace skipping through all these different places. And, uh, you know, you can nitpick and say like, oh, that's not something you would do in, in Star Wars. Well, obviously not, but it shows you glimpses of all these different places. And that's kind of what the movie felt like in a larger scale. So it was a little bit of a problem how fast it was because you couldn't see all the visual design all that well. And um, there was even a city that looked like it looked like Winterhold or something from Skyrim, which was kind of weird. And new costumes throughout. Just in general, the aesthetics were very well done. Um, I actually think this is the best aesthetic job of any of the um, any of the sequels. And I would I would even give it a higher score than nine, except for the fact that the pacing prevents you from really taking in some of the visual design. Next, let's talk about photography, the editing, and uh, you know. CGI effects. I actually give these a 6 out of 10. This is a lower score than I think it would deserve if it were not for the pacing problem. So this is the main place that I have to dock points for the very, very overtight editing. Um, the editing happens so quickly, you just... Um, you're, you're lacking a lot of context in different places. You maybe remember the characters, you maybe maybe remember the dialogue, but the super intensely detailed environment, you just it just kind of falls out of your mind because it just wasn't there on screen long enough for you to take it in. It's a big problem holding back the movie, and it holds back the production as well. It is a ultimately a production decision as well as a story decision, so it can't really be put into any category. But uh, that's where I'm going to dock the points in the in the production section. Another thing that I'll say is a negative is that the blacks really didn't seem very black. And I don't know if this was a problem with like the projection setup I had because it was a it was a digital projector or something else. But whenever there's black, there was a, a large amount of noticeable visual noise, not just um not just like little, the fact that it might be kind of gray, but actually flashing little bits of white noise buried in that black. And I don't know what the, the problem with that was, but I haven't really seen that in other movies, that uh, that kind of noisiness in the blacks. Um, but it was a little bit uh, distracting and it was actually noticeable. The CGI is very omnipresent in this movie, but it's very good. It's generally really well done, whether it is a creature or not. And in general, the creature effects are, the creatures are well designed. Uh, there's like a tiny little, little gnome-like uh, droid bot that's actually a puppet instead of CGI. And uh, those little touches actually, I think, really improve um, the the way that the movie looks. That's part of aesthetics as well. Um, but in general, the CGI looks good. Uh, so sound design is the next part I'll talk about. I'm actually going to give the sound design an 8 out of 10. I think it's an improvement from The Force Awakens. There's a large variety of sounds. Um, they're very present. Uh, there's a lot of use of bass in very effective ways that um, make you really feel the rumble of a ship or the, the building up of a, of a giant blaster or something like that. But at the same time, again, the pacing affects the score. It affects everything. 
there there's so much action and it's so tightly packed together that the overall effect is one of loudness throughout large portions of the movie where there's no real quiet um, where it's just nonstop action and so you don't have any of those peaks and valleys that have that big impact like you'd have in um, say any of the prequels or original trilogy movies instead what you have is kind of a bombastic overwhelming amount of loudness particularly in the end so that really holds it back and kind of prevents it from having a, a higher score but in general the sound design is good I appreciated it a lot and I think without a great sound design you wouldn't have as much aesthetic impact you wouldn't have as much production impact with a star wars movie next music i'm gonna give the music an eight out of ten i felt like it was generally very effective it seemed to be a mixture of a lot of older things and there was callbacks to pretty much everything that i've heard before in star wars um not probably not everything but all the major ones that you might remember and, but at times there was such an exact duplication of what you've heard before. It was um, a little off-putting. It was kind of like an, an extra bit of nostalgia. There's a part where Ray raises up Luke's X-wing out of the water, which is what everyone wanted him, him to do in Return to, in uh, Last Jedi. So she raises it up out of the water, and you hear the exact music from Empire Strikes Back when Yoda raises the ship out of the water it's note for note it sounds like they just took the recording from 1980 and it happens in a couple of places where i'm like this sounds really similar to the original score so i don't know um how much was there but there was some really interesting transmutation of older themes particularly the imperial march and so in some quiet places um, john williams has done this before he did this in return of the jedi really effectively but he takes a theme and reorchestrates it so it's in a different instrument than what he originally played it on you know played it play on orchestra bells instead of brass and it has a really different effect so there's a couple places where he does that and it um it just turns the theme from something that's maybe menacing into something that is reflective and sad and he does this with the imperial march and a couple of other things too i think so in general it was pretty good towards the end of the movie we just don't have that much room for the score to work though it's just the nature of the movie it's so fast-paced it's so breakneck that uh, everything is in the sound and in the dialogue and the the music isn't allowed to be a character the way it was in other movies so but in general, pretty effective. So overall, production score is a 7.75 out of 10. That is, say, high average, um, a C plus, if you will. And again, it could be higher if they improved the pacing. If the pacing was done better, you'd have a couple of points added to that production score. It could be a 9 out of 10 if, um, if the pacing was improved because it would Im improve the effect of everything there. Next, let's go ahead and move on to story. Uh, the story categories I talk about are setting, characters, and plot. I think for a movie like Star Wars, it's valid to include the setting because of how broad the setting is and how much exposition of the setting is usually done in a Star Wars movie. So let's talk about setting first. The setting I give a 7 out of 10. If you're wondering why a 7 out of 10 and not something lower or something higher, it's because of a couple things. So first of all, J.J. Abrams spends a huge amount of time in this movie retconning everything from The Last Jedi. Basically changing all of the reveals from The Last Jedi, which upended his plans for what was going on and uh, basically redid them and found, in a lot of ways, very creative ways to retcon and use stuff from The Last Jedi in a way that would actually make the story make sense. So a couple of things that were retconned, um, you see Leia training to be a Jedi, which basically indicates that she, you know, she actually received Jedi training. This could also be in like the character, you know, character category. You have, you know, some retcons for, um, basically for a lot of things like who Ray's parents are, um, you know, how the first order came about, where Snoke was from. In some cases, they're not complete. And there's a lot of questions that are still unanswered, but he pretty much redid all of the bad stuff from, um, from the last Jedi. He provided a ample explanation for all of the things which were answered poorly in the last Jedi is what I should say. And I think he deserves a lot of credit for that. And in some cases it was very, creative the way he was able to do that and able to use certain elements from the last jedi in a way that um, helped the story and uh, helped the setting move along so that's a big plus um 
However, at the same time, it just continues what he started with Force Awakens, which is kind of a retroactive removal of the impact of what was happening in the original trilogy. This is unavoidable, though, because this entire trilogy is such a copy of the original trilogy. You can't copy without undoing things. And in this one, um, the big thing that they do is they bring back Emperor Palpatine. Now, if you bring back Emperor Palpatine, that basically means that Luke and Anakin or Luke and Vader really didn't accomplish anything by throwing him into the chasm. That their victory, their final victory over Darth Sidious was in vain is what it kind of feels like. But at the same time, that's kind of what you get from the prequels to the original trilogy too. If you weren't familiar with the original trilogy and Obi-Wan died, you'd be like, why are they killing these great characters? Um, But uh, it's unavoidable with that. Um, Maybe we would have done better if they had had a completely different story from the get-go but that's kind of how it ended up being um they added in some new kind of new force powers um but they do it through i mean they do it through the use of a Chekhov's gun which is this force healing power where you're able to you know touch an animal and force it to heal itself and uh Ray uses this on an animal, and then, of course, she's going to use it later to save Kylo, and then Kylo uses it to bring her back from the brink of death. Um, so it's introduced with the Chekhov's gun, which pads the blow of something that we're maybe not familiar with, um, and it works for the plot, so I don't really have a big problem with that. Um, and it makes it feel a little bit less like you're doing it by the seat of the, the pants. When I talk about plot, there's a big feeling that like JJ was writing this as he was going along, but overall, I actually give him a lot of credit for uh, kind of shoring up the setting and making it work. So seven out of ten. Next, let's move on to characters. So the characters, I'm giving a six out of ten. That's a passing score, but it's not a, a great score, and there's a few reasons for that. This is actually, as far as character development goes an impossible task for this movie. But at the same time, it's also the best movie in the trilogy for actually having the characters be likable and for you feeling like you're witnessing the characters the way that you you were encouraged to think of them when you first met them in The Force Awakens. Um, there's a lot of attempts to have character drama in the movie, but because of the pacing, again, the character drama tends to be pretty shallow and fall flat in a lot of cases. The only character drama that really holds up is the drama between Kylo and Rey, but again, we have so much more investment of that in The Last Jedi, so it works in this one because we don't have to spend a lot of screen time reinvesting in that drama, but for other characters, there's just not enough screen time to have the right character interactions and right character development um, to finally bring us to the end. There is character development. It does. It is there, so it's not like it's completely absent. It's just we don't have enough screen time to really show everything that we want there. We do have some backfilling of Ray's Mary Sue sort of status, where we actually see her training with Leia, and we backfill that Leia actually has Force training, and of course she has Force powers because Luke trained her to be a Jedi. But she had turned away from being a Jedi because she had a vision of the future where her son was uh, dead as a result of her, you know, pursuing that. And it's kind of an it's kind of a good backfill, I think. I think we needed to have that. We needed to see Ray actually learning from someone to f- to see her power up to the next level. Like the whole um, movie is kind of about Ray finally powering up to beat the Emperor at the end. So we have to see some training stuff, uh, and I actually appreciated that. Um, there's a couple of things that are set up with really no payoff. There's this stormtrooper girl, like um, stormtrooper deserter that they bring in to talk to Finn and. Um, it just really goes nowhere. She's brought in so that they could have a weird horse charge at this one moment. It's kind of what it felt like. Uh, but they it's just kind of superfluous. Uh, just not enough time to make that character impact really matter. Uh, but it does have a little bit of an effect in letting letting the audience know that there's more hope. You're trying to, to hey, there's pe- people deserting. There's more people who believe in the resistance. It's just a couple of scenes to try to uh, get the audience back on the side of believing that there's a chance that you can win versus where you were left at the end of uh, The Last Jedi, which is no hope. Um, there's a couple of scenes that aren't resolved of Finn trying to tell Ray something about his feelings, either that he loves her or something else. We never find out. We never figure out what he's actually trying to reveal. But there's a lot of 
good character drama that surrounds this. It was very unsatisfying that we didn't have at the end Finn say like, hey, you know, I love you or something, right? We didn't, we never had that payoff. And I really don't know why. Uh, we also have Finn developing force powers. That's what we wanted him to do in Force Awakens. And that is in fact what the first 50 minutes of Force Awakens I felt like was really leading to before it really just went off the rails halfway through the movie and started being about this um, this Star Killer base. So we finally get that, and that's satisfying. Um, the character drama with Kylo, it's the best drama in there, but there's also not a big payoff at the end. Kylo dies. Like he basically sacrifices his life to bring Rey back with like some kind of force healing power. He puts his life force into her. And we're left with like a single kiss and then he like joins the force as a good guy. Basically dies the same way Vader does in Return of the Jedi. Uh, so again, we have a, just a, a reuse of certain plot elements. Um, it just feels very... Just it wasn't a good feeling to to have that end that way. Uh, we really wanted it to end differently. Maybe that's okay that it ends kind of differently from how we wanted to. We kind of want Vader to survive at the end of Return of the Jedi too. Um, I will say there's an interesting effect of the pacing, which is the lack of time for characters to have lots of dialogue interactions. I think actually may have improved the movie because the dialogue we have in the other movies is really cringy. It's this uh, Joss Whedon, really snarky, cringy, awful dialogue. Um, like, you know, where Pin, where Poe is talking to, um, you know, he's talking to, to Kylo Ren and he's like, oh, do I, how do we do this? Do I talk first? That's, a, that's like a Joss Whedon kind of dialogue thing. And it's very out of place in Star Wars and felt bad in the last two movies. Just was very cringy. All of that's gone. It's missing. Uh, like it's a big improvement. And maybe that was because of the pacing or because J.J. Abrams figured out he had to be very serious about this movie and he dropped the attempts at humor and snark and just went full bore into the, the space opera stuff and the drama. But it makes the characters more likable. Uh, I felt like all the characters were way more likable in this movie than any of the previous movies. Finn is actually a very heroic character in this. Poe is a very heroic, competent character. He's very likable and you really identify with his drama and his struggles. And um, at the end of the movie where he's like despairing, it's great acting. Like the actors actually get to act. I just wish there was more time on screen for them to act. Um, in fact, if I saw more characters, I'd probably give this a, a higher character score in general. Um, there's a lot of small gestures in it. We have Luke retconned from being a jerk where Ray like throws the lightsaber into a fire and Luke's ghost catches it and brings it out. And is like, that's no way to treat a Jedi's weapon, which is basically like a big screw you to Ryan Johnson. I appreciated actually those little, those little gestures, even though they're, they're so on the metal level there, I appreciate them, but within the movie, they're just moments. They don't really do that much. Um, and I really appreciated they just kind of pushed Rose to the side. This romance between Rose and Finn never felt good. Um, it just, it felt like a, you know, a derailment from what was really set up in Force Awakens as maybe a little romance between um, Finn and Rey. I think in this movie, they wanted to have a little bit of a love triangle between Finn, Rey, and Kylo, but there just wasn't enough screen time to actually do that. So that isn't there. I will say, you know, we had the Knights of Rin, but we don't really know anything about them still. They just are set pieces. And that's unfortunate as well. So six out of 10 for the characters. That's a passable score. It's not a great score. Uh, plot. I give the plot a five out of 10. I went back and forth. Is this like a three out of 10 plot or is it a six out of 10 or is it a five out of 10? It's a five out of 10. I give it a little bit higher score. That's a high failure rating. And the reason I don't give it a pass is because of the execution of the plot. This is another map plot. So we've had a map plot in Force Awakens. We have a map plot in, in this movie as well. And map plots feel like they're from video games. And the problem with video game plots is that video game plots are different from plots in books and movies. Video game plots exist to get the player to interact with gameplay in a certain way and to move the player through various set pieces of the game. Uh, video game plots aren't there to support, say, character development or things like that. These are these are things that are a part of the dramatic experience and not a gameplay experience. So why do we have a game? Why do we have these gameplay ones? Well, it turns out this actually kind of works. 
because that's what we really need. We really need the characters to shuffle quickly through a bunch of set pieces to get all the exposition pulled out of the, the monkey works or whatever. You, you got to get all the exposition done and we have to do it while action is happening. So having a, we got to get this Sith white wayfinder. We got to figure out where we're going. All of that stuff. It feels like a quest chain from like a video game. And that actually works because that's what we actually need to do for this movie. We need to go through all of the set pieces. The problem with the plot is really with execution is that there's always a contrived item that brings them to the next set piece. Whenever they come up with an obstacle, they just instantly come up with some solution to that obstacle to keep them moving forward. So it, it does feel like a, a question because that's kind of exactly what would happen in, say, World of Warcraft. But um, it, nevertheless, it was able to kind of hold the whole thing together. Um, you get a little bit tired of like Ray like holding up a knife and vaguely deciding that that's where the knife was going to point to where she needed to find this Sith Wayfinder. Um, and then we don't know why Kayla, why Kylo knew about the Wayfinder, why he was trying to find it, how he knew about it. We just don't really have a lot of things explained about the plot. The plot is missing a lot of explanation. What the hell happened to Palpatine? If he fell down that hole, how did he survive? He doesn't tell you. He just says like the dark side is a path to many unnatural things. And we have a lot of unanswered questions as far as plot goes. We have such an extreme pace we often don't have time to evaluate how the plot moved from one area to the next we just know that we're there and that's a little bit of a problem if there was more time spent in each area here's the obstacle and the problem here's the solution that's the way it works we go to this area obstacle and problem here's the solution it goes through that really fast uh, but that's kind of what it needed to do I will say there's also some threads that are introduced and then like immediately snipped so it's like Huck says I'm the spy and then he gets executed for it <laughs> Like immediately. So we don't really get to develop. Now, that's a bit of a, a surprise. I actually kind of appreciated that surprise. I'm like, well, you really surprised me with that. You just went ahead and killed him. But it's like, okay, we, we had Hux as the spy. Now we want to get Hux out of the way so that we can have a real bad guy in charge. So we just kill Hux. We have a new bad guy, by the way. I don't remember his name or anything about him. That's kind of a knock on characters. Um, we did use Chekhov's gun as part of the plot, which is where you show a gun and then, of course, you use it later to resolve a plot point. That's the force heal stuff. Um, I will say that this is the craziest plot in any Star Wars movie ever. This is insane. It has one of the strangest setups ever. Why would Palpatine come back and warn everybody on some weird recording? What a bizarre and strange way to set this up. But there's really no other way to set it up. We we have to start with the final goal. The final goal is to kill Palpatine, just like in Return of the Jedi. So we just say that he's given a warning and then we're going to move everybody there. I will say how J.J. actually got everybody from the end of, end of Last Jedi all the way to fighting Emperor Palpatine again was very novel. I will say the plot ended up working in a very surprisingly novel way, but I'm still not going to give it a passing grade because of all of those little execution things and all the little unexplained this and that uh, that we don't really see, as well as a couple things that probably could have been could have been saved for time just by snipping them out. Um, you know, like, did we really need to go through the extra step of having C-3PO's brain be wiped in order to get the Sith message so we can go to the next thing, only to give C-3PO's mind back to him from r2d2 it's like why did we go through all that it seems like just a little bit of a too much off the side so um it really feels like a plot that was written as he went along and i think that's what was happening so he was having to write the movie while he was he was producing it because on of he was on such a tight schedule to finish uh finish this movie up and actually get it done um i actually kind of got to hand it to jj abrams for getting a story that was actually this is actually the best story of the sequel trilogy and being able to do this while covering up for like a terrible movie that came before it and working under significant time constraints so the overall overall story is a six that's a, actually a passing grade i was once i broke everything down and really thought about it i'm like it is a passing grade he he did a passable job with the story and i actually would give him kudos even though that's just a six the fact that he had to do that while repairing um, all of the story damage that had been done with the middle entry in the series. I mean, it's actually pretty pretty good. It was an impossible task to fix it. And last, lastly, I'm going to talk about general effect. So general effect is the things that aren't quantifiable in 
this continuum, the things about how you feel or how you react. So for me, the general effect, I actually gave it a six out of 10, which is a passing grade. It's a low passing grade, but it's a passing grade. Why did I give it a six out of 10? You know, once you learn to relax and love the bomb, this is a hilariously frantic and melodramatic movie. It unintentionally recreates the the space operas and pulps of yore. It's just full bore action exploding at your face all the way through. The frantic pace actually overcame me and, and I ended up enjoying the ridiculousness of the movie. Even the ending where, where the, like it was like they were pulling new things out and just just trying to make things more and more extreme at the end of the story. I just ended up liking how ridiculous it was. It was um, it really was kind of a callback to old school space opera like like Flash Gordon. And I don't think it was intentional. I think it was just J.J. Abrams stopped caring and just went full bore with it and uh, did whatever he wanted to do, especially towards the end of the movie. And the result was, and he was very serious about it. He was very serious about it. Like you can't achieve this effect without being serious about making it. If you are, this is a problem with the previous two movies. If you are kind of tongue in cheek, if you're making fun of the, the Star Wars universe as you're doing it, it feels really it, it feels really off. You can't parody yourself. It, when you're parody, when you're doing a parody of yourself, it feels insulting to fans. In this case, it wasn't. It was just ridiculous, but it was very serious about being ridiculous, and ended up being ended up having me laugh in lots of places, and um, and really be kind of excited about the, the things that they did. And they had like Palpatine shoot force lightning into the sky and start like taking out this gigantic fleet of of resistant ships you're just like hell yeah i'm i'm blow them up darth destroy all of them i love it you know it's like we've never seen force lightning blow everything up before and it's like well darth sidious can do that so that's what he's doing it's, this guy's really powerful we got to drive those stakes up higher so i ended up in, 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 in i ended up liking that crazy space opera it was uh, the most space opera thing that I think I've ever seen. It was crazy. And I got to say that the ending was like a a strange closing of a Star Wars fan's dream. You know, and I'll probably make another video on, I'm going to call this trilogy the dream cycle sequence, which is it's a, it's a fan dreaming about Star Wars. And so everything's kind of a, a weird dream version of the original trilogy is what we're watching. And that's kind of what it felt like at the end when uh, Darth Sidious gets blown up. Now there's definitely some like cringy moments. That's why it's not higher than six. Like when Ray pulls out two lightsabers, two lightsabers are what's going to get rid of the force lightning. I was just like, this is so dumb, but I just loved watching him it get just obliterated from the lightning. I thought it was so funny. Um, and it was just so like appropriate to what they were doing. They're just like, no, we, the sabers matter. The sabers have matter from the first movie. I'm going to make the sabers really matter for this last scene. And he just whips them both out and it just like blows up Darth Sidious. I, I found myself chuckling at that. And I, if I'm chuckling at it and, I, and I'm laughing at it, that means I'm having a good time. That means it's, it's, it's a general effect thing. I, I generally liked it because of that. If it hadn't been so over the top and serious about itself, while being over the top, I probably wouldn't have enjoyed it as much. Um, and that, that is a, that's a true thing. So that could go up or down. I think most people who came away from this movie liking it, it's a general effect thing. It just overcame them with its insane, explosive action nature. And it kind of overcame me as well in a passable way, not in a, like a high grade kind of way, but it did. So that's going to bring our total score to a 6.6. So 6.6 is a is a D. It's a one and a half to two stars. You know, you could maybe round up to a seven and say it's two stars. Um, that's the best of the sequels. This is the best movie of the Star Wars sequel trilogy. And it's the best movie of the Star Wars sequel trilogy by more than a point. Because Force Awakens was about a five, and I think Last Jedi was like a five point three or something it was very slightly better so this one is significantly better than the other two it felt significantly better it felt more like star wars this is more general effect stuff it um it just felt better all the way through i didn't feel uh i didn't and part of it is i don't care as much right like when you stop caring and just embrace the ridiculousness it's it's just that much better um but it just didn't feel like such a uh, it didn't feel like such an ugly 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 product, I guess. 
Here's the last thing I'll say. This doesn't this isn't relevant to the score. I just thought I'd tack this on because it's a little comment. There's a kiss between two girls at the end of the movie. Of course, people are making a big deal of this. It's in the background. Um, I wouldn't have noticed it if I wasn't looking for it because I knew about it ahead of time. That being said, this is an example of corporate uh, corporate messaging, not trying to normalize homosexuality per se, but rather they show two random extras, two random extra girls kissing. Girls kissing is for whatever reason, well, I don't, shouldn't say for whatever reason, it's because men fetishize lesbianism for whatever reason. Um, Girls kissing is more acceptable than dudes kissing. People are more revolted when men kiss. So they have girls kiss. They have it in the background. There's no gay characters. There's no gay characters in this. So it's not like they're really, they're, they're going to get SJW brownie points for basically doing nothing. I just thought I'd point that out there. It's another little meta thing. I got to say the meta of how this entire trilogy has has played out has been really interesting for me. It's ha- I've had a great time talking about it on my channel. I've had a great time talking to all of you about it. Um, so I'd, I'd invite you to leave your opinions down below as to what you think about this movie and um, you know where your scores are on these various categories and maybe how you think differently from me. You know, Did you like it more? Did you like it less? I think some people are thinking this is the worst of the trilogy. Uh, if I go by my metrics, it's the best of the trilogy and it really felt like the best. Um, Part of it is that I just don't care that much anymore. But I want to hear your opinions. And uh, keep in mind, I am an author, so I do have a couple books out. Latest one, this only came out a week ago. I can't believe it, but it feels like a month. (laughs) I've been working so hard. Eyes in the Walls. This is a straight horror monster story. Uh, I really think this is a cool story, so I hope you'll check it out. It's only 99 cents on Amazon. City of Silver, that's my latest fantasy novel. This is Gunpowder Fantasy. It's kind of unique so hopefully you'll check it out this book i'd like to call 310 to yuma but fantasy so it's uh, about escaping and uh, i think it's it's quite good and for the last bit last two weeks of december you can get the fantasy christmas spectacular 2019 this gigantic tome which has 10 of my books in it including city of silver so if you're thinking of getting this you probably don't have to buy city of silver unless you just like to collect you want to collect all the different paperbacks of it because the the follow-ups will hopefully be out next year. So that's what's happening. Um, Fantasy Christmas Spectacular 2019. There's no Christmas stories in it, so just be aware of that. I didn't write a bunch of Christmas books. It's just my old books in one huge volume. Thanks so much. Don't forget to join my list, dvspress.com list, and you get a free book. I'll see you guys next time.